This morning's reading is from Acts chapter 9, verses 1 to 20. Meanwhile, Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues at Damascus, that if he found any who belonged to the way, men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. Now, as he was going along and approaching Damascus, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Who are you, Lord? I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. But get up and enter the city, and you will be told what you are to do. The men who were traveling with him stood speechless, because they heard the voice but saw no one. Saul got up from the ground, and though his eyes were open, he could see nothing. So they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. For three days he was without sight and neither ate nor drank. Now there was a disciple in Damascus named Ananias. The Lord said to him in a vision, Ananias, here I am, Lord. Get up and go to the street called Straight. And at the house of Judas, look for a man of Tarsus named Saul. At this moment, he's praying. And he has seen in a vision a man named Ananias come in and lay his hands on him so that he might regain his sight. Lord, I've heard from many about this man, how much evil he has done to your saints in Jerusalem. And here he has the authority from the chief priests to bind all who invoke your name. Go, for he is an instrument whom I have chosen to bring my name before Gentiles and kings and before the people of Israel. I myself will show him how much he must suffer for the sake of my name. So Ananias went and entered the house. He laid his hands on Saul and said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on your way here, has sent me so that you may regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And immediately, something like scales fell from his eyes and his sight was restored. Then he got up and was baptized. And after taking some food, he regained his strength. For several days, he was with the disciples in Damascus and immediately he began to proclaim Jesus in the synagogue saying, he is the son of God. Now, sometimes the lectionary gets it just right. And I think today is one of those days. <clears throat> the story of Paul's conversion has a lot to say to us as we grapple with the nature of salvation and what in heaven it has to do with the actual world. As we just heard, in Luke's account, Saul of Tarsus, a Jewish leader and Roman citizen, asks the high priest Caiaphas for legal permission to travel to Damascus in modern-day Turkey. There he intends to scour the synagogues for all those who belong to the way, meaning Jewish followers of Jesus so he might bind them and extradite them to Jerusalem to be punished. <clears throat> Verse 1, so unspeakably powerful, is echoed throughout Acts and by Paul himself. Saul, breathing threats and murder, furiously engaged, persecuting the followers of the way to the point of death, putting them in prison, violently persecuting the church of God, trying to destroy it. 
This is a fearsome and powerful Paul, someone incensed, seething with wrath, intent on ravaging the Jewish Christian community for its blasphemous rejection of Pharisaic law. <clears throat> if you have ever borne witness to this kind of rage, you know it is terrifying. Indeed, isn't this the kind of savage fury we're witnessing day after day in Ukraine? But that is not the point of my sermon today, nor is it the point of Luke's second book, Acts, because on his way to Damascus, a celestial light flashes around Paul, so bright it outshines the noonday sun, and he falls to the ground, blinded by its brilliance. A voice calls out, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? A stunned Paul asks, who are you, sir? The reply comes, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. Get up and enter the city, and you will be told what you are to do. Can't you feel Paul's power dissipate as he rises from the ground only with the aid of his associates, blind and helpless? Imagine his shame, a brute warrior one minute, <clears throat> helpless and trapped in the darkness the next. Michelangelo's fresco, The Conversion of Paul, that hangs in the Vatican is remarkable on so many levels. It's bisected with two groups of actors, Jesus and his angels in the sky and Paul and his men below. Christ seems to be diving from heaven, his right arm outstretched, and the light that emanates from his fingers is dazzling and billowy. It curves around Paul's prostrate body and back toward his riderless horse, forming a perfect shepherd's crook of light. Paul, Christ seems to be saying, don't persecute my sheep, feed them. Now, according to medieval tradition, losing one's pride was often symbolized as of having fallen from one's horse. Hence, Paul is typically portrayed as making the trip to Damascus on horseback. This is highly improbable, yet the symbolism is so powerful. How quick we are to reach for those reins to get back on that horse. Isn't that the proverbial expression? Get back on your horse? reclaiming our hubris, our frail human pride, instead of doing what Paul did, allow himself to be led helplessly away to a different fate, one that involves complete submission to God's view of things, not his own. In today's <clears throat> vernacular, perhaps we might say, Paul was woked. He became woke. He experienced a sense of wokeness, which used to mean only he woke up from sleep. Now, of course, the world word has another connotation. By the mid-20th century, says the Oxford English Dictionary, woke had been extended to mean being aware or well-informed in a political or a cultural sense. In the past decade, this meaning has been catapulted into mainstream use with a particular nuance of alert to racial or social discrimination and justice. The point is, wokeness used to be a good thing, as in, an awakened sensitivity to one's context 
from a moral and ethical point of view. As in, I once was oblivious to the injustices of the world, and now I am aware. As in, I once persecuted the followers of Jesus Christ, and now I am awakened to my crimes. As in, I once was lost, and now am find, found was blind, but now I see. Sounds like Paul to me. Sounds like Jesus to me, whose whole purpose was to enlighten his followers to the sin and injustice in their midst and with the help of God to call it out and do something about it. So what happened? Today, woke has dethroned politically correct and snowflake as the insult du jour for many wishing to mock the hypersensitivity of those who admit that injustice is part of both human and American history. It's as if this poor little four-letter word born in the black community a half a century ago has been crammed full of intolerance and malintent. The argument goes like this. If someone thinks you are not woke, then you're canceled. And how dare you cancel me just because I don't agree with you. And that's a fair point. So we are going to weed out wokery in every nook and cranny of our culture. If you haven't noticed, the war has begun. Now, I must confess, this makes me sad because I like the word woke. It, it makes me think about those scales falling from Paul's eyes as a terrified Ananias lays his quivering hands on him. It makes me think about what it means to see the world differently through the eyes of others, and to understand different truths and realities. It makes me think of all the people I am too busy or asleep to see or hear or reach out to in my daily life. It makes me think of all those breathing threats and murder against others who could, in a flash of insight, be awakened and converted to Christ, and how much I pray for that. Alas, no matter how much I might like this word, I'm afraid we'll have to be prepared to bid it farewell. It is already so misunderstood and maligned, we'll have to invent something else to describe the kind of awakeness Jesus is always trying to teach us. So be thinking about it, my friends. Be thinking about what the next word will be for being knocked off our infernal high horses, hard enough to hear the voice of Jesus calling and see at last the light of his love. Amen.